Hello everyone, welcome to a new video. My name is Marianne Guevara and welcome to all the new subscribers and hello to all the returning ones. Today is going to be a recommendation slash review for one of my new favorite series and that is the Mirror Visitor Quartet written by Christelle DeBose. I was very much inspired to make this video because one, I just recently finished The Storm of Echoes which is the last installment of the series and two, when you go through booktube, you don't really see a lot of videos dedicated to the Mirror Visitor Quartet. Usually just Winter's Promise, the first book, and it's usually in a book haul or in a TBR. But I really wanted to put my thoughts out there and really shout out the series because I think it really needs a lot more recognition because it's one of my favorite series for a reason and I really, really enjoy it. So yeah, without further ado, I'll get you up to speed on the premise of the Mirror Visitor saga or quartet. So the overall premise of this quartet is that there was a great cataclysmic event that occurred that destroyed the Earth, or rather shattered it into several different chunks of uh, floating landmass. So all of these floating islands are like suspended in space and they're surrounded by a sea of clouds. And if you want to travel from one landmass to another, uh, you have to take airships. So this is not only YA fantasy, but it's also post-apocalyptic. Now, these islands, these floating islands are called arcs. And on each arc, there's something called a family spirit. These family spirits aren't really spirits per se. They're closer to demigods. And each of these demigods have a particular power. And on each arc, there's a population that are more or less the descendants of that one family spirit. So, uh, for instance, our main character Ophelia is from the Ark named Anima. And Anima's family spirit is Artemis, and she is known as the mistress of objects. So she has the power over objects. And because of this, her descendants all have to some form or some degree that particular power. Ophelia is... Uh, a particular case or a special case in that she has like two subsections of animism so she can read objects so she's a reader meaning when she touches an object she can sort of read into its past or rather she can understand the emotional state of a person who has touched said object she's also a mirror visitor so she can travel between uh, several mirrors that she has come into contact with the plot of the story really kicks in, so the plot of A Winter's Promise, the first book, is when Ophelia is suddenly engaged to a man from a different arc, which is rarely heard of. It's not very common that this happens. And this is a particular or special marriage because it is a political or diplomatic one. This isn't an engagement that was arranged by her family, but rather the governing body of her arc, Anima. And at this point, Ophelia has already sabotaged two previous engagements. And she is told by the doyens, which is the governing body, that should she make this engagement fail, she, she will be banished from Anima. So she's more or less forced into this engagement. And her future husband, her fiancé, Thorn, ends up taking her from Anima to his arc, the Pole. Life on Anima is what I would consider very quaint, cozy, uh, very homey. It's the complete opposite when it comes to the pole. Not only is the weather very harsh but and the culture very different from anima, Ophelia is expected to enter into a society that is very hostile, that is very cutthroat. People are backstabbing each other, they are constantly trying to kill one another, and not only that, Ophelia is already before she's introduced, she's already hated because one, she's a foreigner, and two, she's engaged to a man that is already disliked or hated amongst uh, the court. So she's basically thrust into a, a situation and an environment that is completely hostile to her and that she has to more or less navigate her way through, determining who can she actually trust. And while she's on the pole, she discovers that her marriage is just a cog in this big mechanism that has bigger ramifications that extend beyond just the pole and anima, but the entire world itself. The premise in and of itself is already so interesting, but it's only by reading that I really came to 
just fall in love with the characters and get really invested in this world and the grand plot that is occurring. There's just so much that I've come to love in this series. Uh, one major thing happens to be the world building. I think when you hear people talk about A Winter's Promise, or at least you know the Mere Visitor Quartet in general, is that it's a very unique world. The idea that Earth was broken and then you have these floating islands that have um, that have their own cultures, their own family spirit, and then specific powers as well. It's it's in it's incredibly fascinating. Just learning what the boss asks you to visualize in your head it it paints a very interesting and fascinating uh, picture. Imagining this world and the thing is the way she builds up the world it's done i feel in a very organic way yeah at first it can be odd trying to visualize what is going on but as the plot progresses i think it becomes much easier because the plot very much flows in with the setting or the background you know it, it just becomes easier at least it did for me another thing that i really love about the series is sort of you know the magic system this idea that these arcs have family spirits and that their descendants um, have subsections or uh, varieties, variations of that particular family spirit's powers. Artemis is the family spirit of Anima and she's the mistress of objects so she can control um, yeah, inanimate objects and so can her descendants to some varying degrees. The average animist can just animate a random object. You know, they can make a carriage drive by itself, they could make a, a cuckoo clock gain sentient life or something like that. And then you of course you have Ophelia who is able to read objects and then travel through a particular object like mirrors. So that's it's very fascinating to see how Artemis is one power, um, how it how it kind of went down through the generations and how it kind of branched out into these various different uh, types. And the same thing can be said for the pole. Now on the pole, which is Thorn's uh, arc, Ophelia's fiance, their family spirit is called Farouk and his power deals with the mind. So all of his descendants have powers that more or less are under this umbrella. On the pole there are clans, there are distinct clans, and there are rigid hierarchies as well. So one clan can be called, uh, they're called the Mirages, so they deal with making illusions. Then you have a clan called the Persuasives, so they can sort of like manipulate you into doing what they want. You notice like all these uh, different families and these particular powers, however they're all just under the umbrella of that one major power of, you know, the mind. And, and it's going to be different uh, with each Ev uh, with every other arc. Aside from the world building, I just admire the pacing of the story in general. I mentioned that there is sort of a grander plot, um, something that is beyond just the court politics of the poll and things like that. There's there's a grander plot brewing in the background and De Bovst does a fantastic job of like slowly but steadily bringing that major plot into the forefront. Another thing that had really great pacing was the romance. This series does have a romance and it's slow burn. And I really mean it, it's a slow burn romance. You see this relationship develop, you know, throughout the four books. And it, it just, to me, it feels convincing their interactions between one another feels genuine. It doesn't feel like this one archetype is talking to this one archetype and what ensues is like a sort of like contrived angsty romance. And when you come to understand each of their positions, both Ophelia's and later on we get a better glimpse of Thorne's position and his thoughts, you really do get to see, you understand why they treat each other the way they do or why Thorn is off-putted and very distant from her and why Ophelia is very annoyed and mistrustful towards him. 
you you get it and you understand the reasons and it makes sense and then when you so when you see them like try to kind of reconnect and more or less team up work together i don't know there's just more impact there's just more weight to it the boss does a good job of sort of building their characters individually uh, along with their relationship and because you get you get very much uh, invested in both of them you also get invested in the relationship another major point i want to mention is ophelia's character development ophelia is constantly developing and growing as a character throughout the four books like i said it's not as if by book one you know by the end of it she she has overcome her her doubts and her fears and her flaws and now she's ready to take on whatever like no it's a continuous process like throughout the book she's um continuously sort of acknowledging her flaws and then working towards um becoming an even better version of herself there's a lot of moments of self-reflection and i don't feel like you get a lot of scenes like that in YA fantasies. And on top of those major points, I just find the Mirror Visitor Quartet to be just great fun. There are several elements that I feel like a lot of people will enjoy. So as I mentioned in A Winter's Promise, this book mainly deals with establishing the world of the arcs, but then you get a glimpse, you really get a good sense of the political intrigue within the pole court. It gets expanded in the second book, The Missing of Claire de Lune, and this one also, this is where the boss really starts um, planting the seeds of that major overarching plot. But also weaving in like a, a mystery, like a detective mystery into this one as well. I mean, as you can tell from the title, The Missing of Claire de Lune. Then when you get to the memory of Babel, you move to a different arc. And once again, the boss... Uh, slowly begins to reveal more and more about this major major plot you get introduced to new characters in this one and you get to see a different culture it's a different direction but still very much a continuation of what the boss has been built up in the previous two and then everything comes to head in the last book the storm of echoes and this is kind of where all the revelations um are happening are occurring and I need to mention the Storm of Echoes because I know that this is a, I'm going to say right now, this one has been, it's been polarizing uh, and people have said they found it confusing. I will say that it does delve into the metaphysical and the surreal. Frankly, if you are into a more straightforward types of fantasies or YA fantasies, I can easily see you guys being turned off but I ended up I still loved this book uh, you can check on my goodreads or on my instagram for my review but I adored this book it broke my heart it did it is a very unique um, series it is very much different from your typical YA fantasies and since you kind of know that going in you should be uh, I feel like it'd be best to be open to um, all the reveals and all the twists and turns that end up happening. And I feel that if you have become attached to characters like Ophelia and Thorne, the way I have, you know, you understand the ending and you understand how it, it just feels right. For me, I really appreciate what DeBose has done, not only for that book, but all four books. It really is one of my favorite uh, series. My favorite YA series for sure. There are series in general that are just for you or like right up your alley and uh, the Mirror Visitor Quartet was definitely one of them was that for me. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope I convinced you to read this quartet or maybe you can uh, suggest it to someone who you, you think might be interested in it. And if you have read the Mirror Visitor Quartet, if you are fellow Mirror Visitor fans, uh, please comment down below I'd love to have a discussion with you or talk about, you know, the series with you in general. So yeah, without further ado, I'll catch you guys later. If you like the video, leave a comment, leave a like, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.